Hola, comadres. Welcome to the 19th episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have an amazing guest. Her name is Alicia Renee. And I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, everyone. I'm Alicia Renee. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Like, your your child has autism? Yes. Okay. Um, so I... Um, Actually, I'm a mother of two. I have two boys. My oldest is 17. He's a junior in high school um, and he has ADHD. And then I have my 10 year old um, who it has um, was diagnosed with autism. Um, okay. I work in healthcare. I've worked in healthcare for over 10 years. I'm really passionate about it. I okay. have my undergrad and grad in, um, you know, science related degree um, fields. And so I really specialize in healthcare, um, healthcare policy. And I've always um, been an advocate, you know, trying to promote, you know, no matter what the topic was in healthcare, like, please speak up for yourself, advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is funny because when this stuff was happening to me, I had no clue what to do. I, you know, I really, I really did struggle um, a lot. Um, okay. But that's like, I don't know how much detail to go into. No, that's, um, good. that's good. Okay. Um, so okay. I just wanted to um, bring up the topic for our audience. So basically, we're going to be discussing developmental mi milestones. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the topic came up is because I got a comadregram in my DMs and Instagram asking me to explain how I knew my child had autism or that something was not right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's an important topic because a lot of people don't know. And um, a lot of the parents of the students that I uh, service are really unaware um, yeah. you know, or in denial, not necessarily yeah. by their own fault, like not on purpose, but right. they basically just are not aware what to look for. And a lot of the time when, you know, when they consult other people that are older, um, I'm from the eighties. <laughs> I saw me a meme too. today that was like, wait, <laughs> it was a meme that was like, oh, you guys are from the 1900s. Mm -hmm. I was like, first of all, don't be disrespectful. I'm I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's exactly like what? But yeah, so when they ask people from other generations that are before us, they're like, oh, no, that's nothing. It's normal, whatever. So, you know, I feel like part of my job is to create advocacy, to create awareness. And then to, um, you know, if I can just help one mom and a child, I feel like I would have done my job. So you already, um, Alicia, you already touched on your child's diagnosis. So I want to go in a little bit into history kind of with yeah. him and ask you, when did you notice that your child was different? Um, I noticed around six months um, that something was definitely off. Um, and then when I say that, I mean, again, I had something to compare by. Well, some moms that are new or that aren't sure don't have anything to compare by. But again, my oldest son, he was um, seven when I um, um, brought my youngest son home. And when we were, he was six months, he was like really focused. Like if you took a picture, the flash of the on the camera, he loved it. Um, and like literally, like we would play. Like I didn't. I mean, now I feel bad that I did it, but I would literally cut the phone, the light on the phone, so he could like play with it because it like mm. that was he wasn't playing with other toys. Like he wanted to play with the light on the phone. He wanted to. Um, he wanted to just do things that just were way beyond his time. I remember also to um, coming he. <laughs> running in the bathroom because god knows he was a quick quick guy he was in the bathroom he already had started like rolling unrolling the toilet paper um and i my oldest son didn't do that until you know a lot he was a lot older when he did that but he you know was maybe eight months and he already had stood up it was you know standing up and just trying to figure out how to do these things and so i knew something wasn't right but i just well it really wasn't sure what it was so it was just like you know, I'll figure it out. Like, I don't know. And I would ask, talk to the doctors about it. And it was just like, fine. You know, we really, really wasn't too much to do at that time. But definitely at his two year old checkup, mm -hmm. um, we had some concerns. And when I say we, me and the doctor, um, we went in for the checkup and she's like, why isn't he talking? 
And I was like, that's what I've been telling you, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so she's like, yeah, he should be talking by now. He should be saying, you know, a couple, he should be saying at least a few words. And at this point, he really wasn't saying anything. He maybe said mom, mama, or dad, dad, but that means that was about it. And this is at two years old. Um, Mm. So that initial, that really like kicked off that, that moment kicked off a whole roller coaster ride to be honest with you um so she said you know i'm going to refer you to this um, program um, which is the infants and toddlers programs i'm not sure if every state has an infants and toddlers program but in maryland where i live we have an infants and toddlers program and what the infants and toddler program does is they um have resources dedicated um to come to your house personally or to your daycare center and they provide um services so xavier mm, did okay. start to receive early intervention so while we're doing this early intervention with him, um, then I got a referral to have him ha- go to a Children's National Hospital, which is one of the big hospitals here in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. But it's really located in mm-hmm. D.C. But for your listeners that are familiar um, with the DMV, um, he went to Children's. He went to Children's Hospital and we started to see a child developmental psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I learned that only they can diagnose children with autism. No, no medical doctor, no, um, no one from your school system, mm-hmm. a child developmental psychologist. And I think that's so important because um, you'll talk to people and you'll have them weighing in on their opinion on what your child you know, what's going on with your child when really they don't have the skill set or the true authority to be diagnosing your child. Um, So we started that process with um, the developmental um, psychiatrist, and that was a two-year process. And just to also, I want to throw that out there to be really honest with parents that if you suspect something is wrong um, or just not right with your child, and when I I don't want to say wrong in a negative way, like a Don't take that the wrong way. But if you feel that there's something not right, um, talk to your pediatrician, get the referral, and then immediately make that appointment um, for the child developmental psychologist. Because I had to wait three months, and I'm hearing now from friends and family that have concerns that there's a six-month wait. So it just goes to speak to the the fact that there is a shortage in this area of specialty, um, and then the demand is also greater, right? Um, and then, so I want to pause there just because that was a lot of information, I think, for someone listening. Um, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so after we went through that process, um, we were seeing the child, um, the, the developmental psychiatrist. And then um, we had a referral to an outside um, service that provided speech language therapy for him. And we did the speech language therapy two times a week. Um, and that was his individual um, therapy. And then he also received uh, a social group because, like I said, at that time he wasn't speaking. And mm-hmm. so I really struggled with how to communicate with my child. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I struggled. Um, he had my son, some of his symptoms early on um, was for daycare. I had to every day when I dropped him off at daycare, he had to ring the doorbell. If he did not ring the doorbell um, to the daycare center, Mm -hmm. nobody was having a good day. And it literally would take me 30 minutes to an hour to get out of there. Um, And I I remember a daycare before I found this daycare, they like really put him out. It was really hard to find a daycare for him because I would take him to, you know, those sessions where they'll, um, you know, the the trial run. Well, they want to see how well does your child do in this setting is a good fit. And Mm -hmm. I mean, we did the, we did a lot of those and he just wasn't a good fit And it. Again, I didn't know what was going on and they didn't know what was going on. And so it was really a struggle. So then I found this daycare, um, explained to them, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Please don't kick us out. And she, she, um, she was a Pakistani lady and she said, she said, I'm going to work with you. And, you know, that's music to a mother's ears Mm -hmm. when they're struggling, trying to work. And I was also in my graduate program at this time. So stress was really high. 
Um, so we continued to do that. He had the ring the doorbell. And then he also had this, um, there was a grate um, in my, I lived in an apartment complex at the time. Um, and there was a grate in the ground. And every day when he walked out to go to the car, he had to step on it. And when he came back home, he had to step on it. He would not walk in, he would not go into the house unless he stepped on it. Also with his toys, he lined his toys up. Um, he had Thomas trains, he had dinosaurs, whatever he played with, he had to line it up. He also had um, this need to play with like um, toilet paper rolls or paper towel um, rolls. Um, so those were some of the things that he did. Um, and then again, the eye contact, it's just, there was no eye contact. And of course, I didn't really pick up on it until the infants and toddlers came into my home and like really did an assessment of, um, you know, how they could better help me communicate with my child and how I could better help him. The first thing they said had to go um, was his pacifier because he was still, you know, two and a half, almost three mm -hmm. at this time, um, still with his pacifier. And I was like, don't take that away from me. Like I was panicking because that was the only thing that gave him relief. And I was okay with it because, you know, it helped me and it helped him. Right. Um, and then another thing too, is that if I passed the McDonald's, um, he would scream, like he would scream. He had, to, I had to stop at McDonald's and I didn't have to, but it, I was like, I felt, I didn't feel like I had a choice, but to stop like every single day to get him something from McDonald's. Um, because also too, there was a McDonald's that lived that was um, on the corner where I lived. And so he would scream for that. He, we had to stop. Um, we couldn't deviate from our routes. If we did deviate from a route, he would want to, um, he was screaming and hollering in the car. It was just, it was really, really difficult. So, yeah, I want to say that I also noticed a lot of things that were like a little different with my son. Um, the guests know already that he was talking. He had about okay. 25 words. And then all of a sudden, one day he went silent and it kind of it was like a curtain went over him um, in the sense that I look at photos before and he actually had eye contact yeah. and then afterwards not so much and then um it was just kind of just like he was getting frustrated because he wasn't able to communicate so he would like right. lash out in a way well not lash out like hit me but he would like try to bite actually yeah um so that was like big because I like he wasn't like a, a like a kid that was like a biter right. so it was interesting to me and then my aunt who was a teacher in the Dominican Republic she was on vacation visiting and she was the one that first noticed that he wasn't talking and she was like hey Marcia he does Aiden doesn't speak and I was like what do you mean right. and then we started listening and we noticed that he really wasn't speaking um besides the eye contact and the and the and the speaking I feel like he walked, I feel, kind of on time. Mm -hmm. It was like he he used to crawl backwards. I don't I don't know if that's normal for kids, but like he he never actually crawled forward. He would like go backwards kind of. Um and then when he fight he started walking the day after his first birthday. Yeah. Um but besides that, I remember um there was a couple of instances we would go to the supermarket and he would cry like yes. like hysterical at first i thought he was like in pain because it was like that kind of cry yes and i was like i couldn't explain that i didn't know what was going on um to the point that we would have to leave the supermarket because yep. i didn't know yep. how to calm him down and, and and once we left he was fine but i'm thinking now maybe it was like the 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 fluorescent lights maybe yeah because he does have like um Sensory, sensory processing mm -hmm. disorder so he does um he doesn't like loud noises but what's funny with him because i was talking to his babysitter about this yesterday he doesn't like loud noises from other people but he will have his music yes. and his cartoons up like all the way very loud yes and bothering <laughs> other people but mm -hmm. you know if you're loud next to him he's like um mom can you put the volume down on your tv okay. or whatever um what else did i notice textures like he wasn't yeah. he wasn't really fond of certain textures so i was just talking to one of the guests that i had in the podcast before mm -hmm. yadi um and she was telling me that her son also has issues with texture but i was telling her he wouldn't eat i don't know if you've ever had dominican food um we have like this breakfast kind of like or like kind of like a lunch thing it's like mashed plantains 
Oh, so um, mango, right? like mafongo. Like, well, it's softer than mofongo. Okay. Mofongo is like fried and then mashed. But this is like literally like a, like a plantain puree. But okay. it's like a staple for us. And he wouldn't eat it at all. Mm -hmm. I had to like introduce it slowly and have him eventually get used to it. But it's not something that he'll tell me like, hey, I want to eat that. So like yeah. a lot of things with texture and like sensation. And he didn't actually like being hugged. I had to like wear him yeah. down. Yeah. Um, which was like, it was sad for me because I'm a very affectionate person. Like, I'm always like kissing and hugging on, on my yeah. friends and my family. But like, you know, I couldn't do that with him at the beginning. But like, I feel like he, now he's used to it. He'll just randomly come yeah. and like hug me and kiss me. Um, but yeah, I guess I went like we, to the we same thing. Experiences with yeah, that. I, I, this, I experienced the exact same thing. And even to the food, even to this day, he's 10 now. Um, he was diagnosed at, um, I think we got the official diagnosis. Um, it was in 2015. So I think he was three, maybe getting ready to turn four. Um, and I remember I just, I just cried. I didn't know what, to, what to do. Um, but he definitely had some sensory issues. Um, the tags in your shirt, even now mm -hmm. I have to cut the tags out of his shirt. They bother him. Um, at certain foods he will not touch. He literally, I think we are up to maybe 15 items that he'll eat. Um, okay. but that's about it. Um, and it really rotates, you know? So when he was, you know two and three he would make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and oatmeal like that's all he would eat he would not eat anything else but peanut butter and jelly and oatmeal literally oatmeal for breakfast lunch dinner snack and peanut butter and jelly that was it oh and gosh. then then he moved on to um only eating rice and then and i mean he would only eat rice and he would only mm -hmm. eat french fries and he would only eat nuggets and mm -hmm. i tried to introduce uh vegetables and no fruit. I remember one day he ate one blueberry. I was like, I begged him, please just try this. Um, mm -hmm. cause they kept, the doctors kept telling me to try to, you know, put little items on his food, keep trying to introduce food, even if he doesn't need it, just keep introducing. And then he, I remember this one day he like had this desire to just taste it. I put it on this nice bowl and he grabbed one and he ate it. And of course he spit it out, but I was just like that was a big deal for me. Um, and I don't think, um, yeah, unless you're a mom that, that has experienced that, like you don't really don't understand how big of a deal that is and how that's a moment that you're just grateful for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I remember potty training and I just definitely want to hit on that because I always right. hear moms talk about potty training and how difficult it is. And I'm going to tell you, yes, it is very hard and you are going to cry. You are going to get frustrated. You're going to want to give up. And then you're going to say, but no, I got to get out of these pull-ups. I don't like, I don't want to do this. And I just remember this one day I um, was having this conversation. I started to open up with people at work. I'm um, thinking of people that I trusted about what was going on, you know, in my personal life and what I was dealing with. And so I had shared um, that I was potty training and I was struggling. And I remember the lady I was talking to and she's like, well, you know, my niece is nine and she's still not potty trained. And I just remember leaving her office thinking I cannot be like I can deal with anything else, but I just cannot deal with that. Please God, you know? And so I started doing some research and I found on Pinterest, it's called a weekend potty training. And um, we did that um, and we did it for about two or three weekends until he really started to use the bathroom on his own. And then I just continued it. So I definitely want to recommend the um, three weekend, the weekend potty training method. And really what you do is you just let, you don't go anywhere for the whole weekend and you just let the child be naked. And then every five to 10 minutes, you sit them on the pot and That's just re did. yep. And did it work for you? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yes. It took yes. a while though. Like, yep. um, I want to say he went to, uh, pre-K mm -hmm. and he was still not fully potty trained, but by the time mm -hmm. he was five, yep. he was good. Um, yep. but it wasn't like a joint effort. It was between, it was between me, the the um, the ABA therapist, um, his teachers in the in the socialization program, the pre K teachers too. Like everybody was like making sure that he was yeah. like doing that. And then right. also like I took away the diaper. Like those pull ups, I feel like because they have that extra absorbent material, yes. it doesn't let them be uncomfortable. Right. So they don't really notice when they pee on themselves. Right. Um. I mean, he was potty trained for pee for uh, for early, like like you know before he was five, a little bit before he was five. But then the the actual um, 
poopy. Yeah. Um, no, no, oh, no, definitely took some time. Yeah. Same. And it was definitely was a joint effort between the daycare. And then, like I said, he was in the infants and toddlers program. So after they come to your home and then you transition to preschool, um, you'll have, they'll have, they'll send a bus to come to your daycare center and transport your child to uh, early intervention um, center where they have special educators that will, um, and, and your child is um, in an environment with other children that have developmental delays, they might ne not necessarily have the same diagnosis as your child, but they'll have some form of developmental delay and they'll all teach them. And so those interventions really help. They definitely, you know, encourage bringing extra pairs of clothes because they definitely help with the potty training. So it was me, it was the daycare center, and then it was the early um, childhood center in my county that helped with the potty training. Um, and yeah, it definitely took some time because I do remember um, I was really concerned about the daycare kicking me out because, you know, they want your kid fully potty trained and he was not. And mm -hmm. the daycare teachers, um, they really, they really gravitated to him. My son, his name is Dean, um, but we call him Xavier or Zay. Um, they really gravitated to him and they really worked with him. And I think as the years um, went on before he had to leave to go to kindergarten, he, mm -hmm. the relationship was there and they knew kind of what would tick him off or what would cause him overload. And it was like the new people that came in that really had the problems that struggled with him. I think it's because um, they didn't know him and they didn't know how to work with him and communicate with him. So I de really definitely yeah. had to do a lot on my part to educate them, to um, ask and I reached out to the county and said, hey, can you come to my daycare and teach the, you know, talk to the daycare uh, teachers and show them ways on how they can communicate with him because my child is not going to be the only child that's going to walk through these doors with this, you know, with this with these symptoms, with anything. And you guys need to be able to help parents recognize it. You know, that's, you're there teaching a child. And so I feel like it's also their duty as well mm -hmm. to say, hey, I think you, I, I would like to refer you or I want to talk to you about my concerns. And I know those conversations can be really hard, but um, it's still really important for us parents as well as those daycare centers and um, anybody that is in that, a family member to say, hey, you know, I'm not really sure that, you know, your child is progressing the way they should. And I think as parents, we need to not be offended by that. Um, I want to also say too, my son went through the same thing with um, coming into um, homes and wanting people to hug him. He had to walk around, even my mother's house. He, before he would speak to anybody, give her a hug, nothing. He didn't want anybody touching him, but he had to walk around the entire house, my grandparents' house. He had to walk around the entire house, two floors to make mm. sh just to, I don't know what he was looking for, but he had to, he had to walk around the whole house. And then once he walked around the house, he was, he would settle himself and then he would kind of kick in and he knew where my grandfather's iPad was. And he would like, just grab the iPad and it's, my son is really good with numbers. He's really good with numbers and he's really good with um, like me memorizing things, um, mm -hmm. especially numbers, right? Um, and so he remembered my grandfather's password, right, to his iPad. He remembered my <laughs> password to my iPhone. So if he was, you know, he, he, and he's still that way now at 10. If you give him a number, he's going to remember it. It doesn't matter what it is. And he's just really good with that sequential I don't know what to call it, but he's just really good with that. Um, and so we really try to, you know, work with that and tell him that. And he's a, he has got really arrogant um, now that he's 10. He's like, I'm smarter than you. He thinks he's smarter than me. <laughs> um, so he has those moments of where he just asks those questions. And I don't, I, I didn't get how old your son was, Marcy, but um, he, what my son does now. is he, how old is he? 13 now. Oh, 13. Okay. Yes. So I don't, maybe you might have went through this as well is that um, he has these conversations where he'll say, you know, what kind of cloud is that? And then if I tell him, I don't know, he's like, you're 30 something and you don't know what this is. And then oh, he'll no, start, <laughs> he'll start to start telling me about a cloud. Right. And why is it formed this way? And what causes it, you know, what will cause it to rain? And he, he just is really in depth and detailed on things that like, I don't care about to be honest with you. And this is like, I'm so glad you know that. And then he just oh, asks, he just asks his questions that a normal, or I don't even want to say normal because I hate saying things like that. Um, but typical. 
Right. That he just asks and does things that just aren't typical. Right. And you, and I just sit back and look at him like, what do I do? How do, how do I correct that? And, and like right now, my issue is correcting him with his behavior because he, it might come off as rude, but he's really asking a question. You know, we come from this generation where if, a, you, a parent tells you or an adult tells you to do something, you do it, right? And so if you say, hey, go put your shoes over there, my son was going to say, well, why do I have to put them over there? Why can't I put them here, right? And so it, it starts that back and forth dialogue where people think he thinks he's being rude when mm -hmm. he's saying, I'm just asking a question. Um, and he's just, and he really struggles with understanding that balance between being respectful to an adult and what you can and can't say, you know, back and forth to an adult. And he's just like, but that's stupid. I don't understand. I'm just asking a question. You know, I'm not being smart. And if you call him rude, he's offended by it. Like he mm -hmm. literally has had tantrums or, and I don't want to call him a tantrum, but really like a fit where he's emotionally like breaking down because mm -hmm. he just doesn't understand why anyone would think he was rude. And he's like offended by it. Um, so we definitely had, um, struggle with that and we still now to this day still try to figure out okay do i correct him on this or do i let this go do i dwell on this mm -hmm. and hope that he won't do it again or is he going to do it again and then i'll say something and so it's that piece of it that is just really not clear there's no book on what to do there's you know and it is also people aren't as open you know about what their what their child went through and how they helped um help get through it right and i think for and i, I think i'm think i'm guilty of it right once i got past a certain stage i did not look back because i never wanted to go back right i didn't want to go backwards i didn't want to deal with it again it was hard um and i think also there was a lot of judgment, right? I remember when we went to theme parks or we went to the pool, I had my son on those little book bag leashes um, or, or a harness that they call it. Um, yeah. But literally my family was upset with me. They were like, why do you have him on that? He's not a dog. Um, and I was like, he's a runner. Like my son was a runner, Girl. a runner. At the, at the blink of an eye, my son could take off and he has done that. He did that to me several times. He took off. I couldn't even take him to the park. We couldn't go to church. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. we couldn't go anywhere. The things that the, the grocery store, like you said, he did the same exact thing. He would have a fit and I didn't know why. And so I was like, we're banned from ever going to Harris Theater again because I didn't know what to do. And um, mm -hmm. people were judging me. And it was just like, I have to do what I know, what I think is best right now, because I don't know what to do. I, I wonder, I'd rather mm -hmm. keep him safe than for, and have you judge me than to try to appease the society norms and keep up my son at harm risk, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then people, I just want, people always oh, sorry. have an op It's okay. People always want to have an opinion about something all the time. Yeah, all but the time. Yeah, and I had wanted to share um, this because I, and I I feel like it's important to share because it happened to me and it, and I still remember it. You know, um, I was in the grocery store and um, I said I, I just kept trying trying the grocery store. Um, and at this point, I really didn't have a choice. I'm a single mom. I didn't have a choice but to take him with me. I um, mean, we needed food, um, so I went to Harris Teeter and we we made it right. You know, when you first walk in, the produce are right there. I don't think we made it to the second level of the produce section before mm -hmm. he started screaming and hollering. And, I, and maybe it was the lights. Maybe it was the temperature. Maybe it was him being confined to the cart, or like the in smells. the part. Yes, exactly. Like, I don't know what was triggering him, but it triggered him. And he started to scream. And this lady, a white lady, and I think that's important, too, because you see, I'm African-American. And this white lady came over and non-judgmental she just she and she kept her distance but she said i'm standing with you if that's okay i said yes she says i just want you to know i'm here to um you know to protect you and to support you and that you're not by yourself she and then she started to explain to me you know who, who she was and that she worked with and she recognized my son's symptoms and that she worked with the infants and toddlers program and then so we started this conversation about, yeah, my son's in this. He just got in. And then we started talking about who he was working with. And so it made a difference to me because while everybody else was staring at me and mm -hmm. pointing fingers at me, I can't control my child. She was there and she was willing to step in and 
be a support system for me to get through that moment. And we need more people to not judge moms yeah. who have children that's in a public place that's having a fit because it's not that we told them no. It's not that we said we weren't getting them something, you know? It's the child is having uh, having difficulty communicating what is going on with them and how we can help them. And, you know, at that point, you just don't know how to help them. And I just really wanted to share that because I hope by sharing this, your audience or they'll share that with other people and maybe we can continue to pass this along that, you support we're supporting each other right that yes. we're not judging i mean and we're not gonna get everybody to come on board and i'm mm -hmm. i know that you know but at least at least get you know it's just one person it, yes. it, it makes a difference listen um i went through that a lot like uh yeah. i've there i have an episode that i talk about traveling um and uh we were in dominican republic and uh we went to go see the first church of america mm -hmm. uh so were there and he wanted to be in this but he was there and he had his ipod at the time this was before he had an ipad and he was like playing on his ipod he was listening to some music but it was really loud mm -hmm. and um somebody from the church came over and was like um yeah you can't do that here you gotta go yep. so it happened um, to me too i was super embarrassed i like walked out with him but he wanted to be in there so he started to have a tantrum outside the church Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the tantrum, the one that they throw yep. the on the floor, they're crying, screaming. Yep. Um, he's like pulling away from me. And um, all these people are walking by and they're looking at us and they're like, oh, let me get him for a week. I'll fix him. Blah, 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 blah. Yep. Heard that too. Completely not like, like disregarding the fact that this is not a, like a typical reaction of a child, especially a child that's like three or four years old. Right. And then like them making that comment is actually not helpful in the moment. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like, you know, stuff like that, like I, it happened to me in New York too. A lot of people are, are like, or like you need help and they just kind of like walk by. I feel like New Yorkers are yeah. really good at that. Um, yeah. Yeah. An <laughs> another thing. Um, we'll walk you know, right on by. Yeah. <laughs> yo, for real. And then the, another thing is like, they'll like, what was it he did? He threw his blanket out the window. He had this little blanket that he oh loved. Gosh. He wanted to see it fly. So he threw it out the yes. window, left the apartment to go get it. And then a stupid neighbor that I had that she doesn't live here anymore. She actually opened the door and Aiden went to the streets. Oh, no. He was walking barefoot yeah. in the actual street yeah. where the cars are driving by. Yeah. And if it wasn't for one neighbor that he knows, like he went and like chased after him and got him for me. I don't know what could have happened. Like, it's really right. crazy. But I mean, I can't say that everybody in the neighborhood is like that, but there's a few. But yeah. um, another time, because this is, this, I feel like autism and danger are like married to each other. Yeah, the they are. They oh are. My gosh. Another time we went to Target and um, I we took an Uber back, right? And I'm taking the bags out of the car and I leave them sitting in front of the building by mm -hmm. the gate. And I'm like, don't move. Right. Um, so when I went, I literally turned around for two seconds to grab the one or two bags that were left. And when I turn around, I don't see him there. So I'm like freaking out. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, maybe he scared, went upstairs. Yeah. So I go upstairs. I look for him, not there. I go to the fifth floor to the roof. It There's an alarm on the door because I live in an apartment building. The alarm mm -hmm. didn't sound. I'm looking for him, looking for him. I go to the other side of the building, nothing. Oh my God. So then I'm like, let me retrace my steps. I couldn't find him. He's like four, like, yeah, four years old. So I'm walking, I'm going down the block. I'm like, maybe he walked somewhere to the store. So I went to the bodega. He wasn't in there. And then I, I like, when I walked to the corner, I'm like freaking out at this point. I'm like stress sweating. I'm like, I'm going to jail. I cannot find my child. Something uh, yeah. happened to him. So then um, the people from the pharmacy across the street see me and they're like, Vecina, he's here. Oh, no. He crossed he the street the by himself. Oh. He went to the pharmacy and he's sitting behind the counter like nothing happened, looking at one of their newspapers because he was like really into newspapers. Yeah. And at that point, I'm just like, but they knew him because like, you know, they've been working with me like since yeah. he was a, a child and they're like, we seen has nothing. Don't worry about it. Like, don't worry. Just make sure that you're like, you know, you hold his hand and that he doesn't do that again. And I was just like, oh, my God. But, like, stuff like that happens all the time. And, like, you know, if I, like, at least if those people weren't in my corner, I probably would have been yeah. in jail or something like that. You right. know, like, 
it's just really crazy and it, it's really it's really important like you said to raise awareness and for people to be more cognizant of that and instead of make like halting judgment because the judgment really doesn't help create a more inclusive environment yeah and i i would say too um even even um from our community i've i've received like the negative comments i remember um the Baltimore Oreos um, was having an event and they uh, for autism. And so they were allowing, um, you were able to sign up um, and they like had like a suite um, dedicated for um, parents and children, um, you know, that care for children with autism. And so I signed up, I was in there and I thought that was a great opportunity. Like I could meet some moms that were going through what I was going through um, and maybe I could get some tips of what's happening. And um, I know where some people don't really uh, care for labels, um, but if I had to describe where Xavier was on the spectrum, they consider him high functioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were at the event and, you know, he was doing his thing. He was running around and, I, you know, it was a safe space for him to do that because, um, you know, all the kids were like, you know, playing around, doing their thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was, a, it was, it, we were able to be themselves, you know? And so one of the moms towards the end when it was time to go, um, we were introducing ourselves and she's like, he has autism. He doesn't look like it. What does autism look like? I, I, and that, and so, and in that moment, I just, I was like, what? Um, and then like, I went to, I remember, I remember it cause um, he would, my son, he was on the floor spinning around, like just spinning around. And I was like, I'm just gonna let him do what he's doing. Right, We're, like I had my oldest son with me. I had my nephew with me. And so I, I had other kids with me. So I was just like, I'm gonna let everybody do what they're doing. We're in a, we're in a confined space where no one can escape, right? So I was like, well, let me get him off the floor. Cause I, at this point I'm like, I don't want him on the floor anymore. So I went to get him and she's like, he doesn't look like he has autism. And I just was like, okay. And I just got him and then we went to, I sat down in my seat and I just like was processing how I felt um, about it. And then towards the end, she's like, you know, I'm so sorry I said that, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I, but the damage had already been done. You know what I mean? Like it had already been done that I felt like I knew then, like that was the day that I knew I was by myself. That, and it might not be true, right? But it was the, that's how I felt at that moment, especially dealing with uh, trying to get, we didn't have the diagnosis at the time, but we just, they suspected mm -hmm. it. And so I just knew then, like, I felt like I was by myself. Nobody would ever understand how, how I felt and how I was struggling with trying to raise him. And, um, and then I really worried about his future. Like that was the day that I was like, I, like he's black <laughs> he doesn't look like he has autism he won't get the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. um how am I going to protect my son how how and, and it's like I that was the day I, I had never felt that hopeless that low before in my life um and I didn't have anybody to really share it with you know like I I didn't feel like I could share that with my sister my mom and I shared a lot of stuff with my mom but it wasn't the helplessness is what, because, you know, we're strong. Like, how dare you be helpless, right? Or hopeless. Um, so I didn't feel like I could share that, and but I was. And I just was like, I went to autism speech. I started printing out all of their stuff. I mean, I started reading every book that I could find on autism, which really don't do that. Because, I mean, yeah, no. there's no, <laughs> there's similarities in how and what people go through, but the how to fix it or in a, and I'm using air quotes when I say fix it, but how to correct it or what intervention your child's going to need is going to vary, right? It varies yeah, it completely different for every single child. Um, but I started and then I, like I said, I was in my graduate program. So I started doing every, any project that the, I was given, I made it, a, I made sure my public health topics were on, all of them were on, um, on autism, on the spectrum. You know, I really wanted to understand why even did research with CDC. I reached out, called the CDC. Like, I need to know why it was one in 68 at that time. Now I think it's one in 44. It's yep. like, I need to know why in my area, boys are, you know, getting diagnosed at a higher rate. I want to know why 
you know, I will, you know, why, why, why is this, why is it so prevalent now? And what's happening? Like, is it something I'm, is it something that I'm eating? Is it something that I gave my child? Like, I really was trying to figure out the why behind it. And so I think I spent a lot of time trying to figure out the why and on top of trying to figure out how do I help him? And then what's next, right? So then after fast forward to getting the diagnosis, it's like, okay, so now I have the diagnosis. Now, what do I do, doc? Right now, what do I do? And they're like, it's like, you just keep, I'm like, so I just come back whenever I feel like it. And they're like, there really is no book. There is no guidance on what, you know, what to do. Um, we couldn't get ABA. My insurance did not cover ABA. My insurance still doesn't cover ABA. Um, and so I was just like, really, I felt, I just felt like I, I couldn't get him help. And I still feel like I can't get him the help that I, that he needs. I go back and forth with the teachers following his IEP. I go back and forth. I mean, every every school year, I have to have I, I have to have you know I have to go off, and when I mean go off, I mean I go off um, because. Listen, if we gotta be that crazy mom for our, our kids, you be yeah. that crazy mom. Yeah, but and I, I and then I feel here. bad because I, I, I apologize. Be, I, be, I don't feel bad nothing, no, because yeah. listen, I be the whole Karen with them. I yes. be like, as per my conversation with you, yes, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> follow up email, hello. <laughs> Yes, like I literally just went through this the other day. I just went through this the other day. I'm just like, I was like, I have no more patience with this teacher. And, you know, I eventually apologized because I I didn't want to disrespect him, but I wanted him to understand how disappointed I was and how he's teaching my son. Um, we're virtual. One minute they're virtual. The next minute they're in the classroom. The next minute they're virtual again. And right now they're virtual. They're supposed to go back on school to school on Tuesday. Um, and just to throw this out here too, like I had tested positive for COVID January 1st and then he started to get sick. So I, it was really a, a miscommunication about the excused absence and the unexcused absence. They decided, his teachers decided to give him zeros for those days what? that we he was absent from school. So now my son has three E's in subjects, right? And I'm going off because... He just had on the road. Like, how how is it possible that he? And so I started to do my investigation, and I see, oh, they just gave him zeros. But it's like, why would you give him zeros when I just communicated to you that a I tested positive for COVID, b he has COVID symptoms, and I'm concerned about the health of my child. And your instinct is to give him zeros. I just felt. Nah. I felt like, again, alone. I felt like there was no understanding. There was no empathy. There was no compassion. There was no support. But yet, at the same token, these teachers will ask you to give them money for a project for their classroom, Mm -hmm. but you can't inquire on how my child's doing. You can't um, pull him into a separate group and try to make sure he understands whatever the topic is. And then I, I go back and forth with myself is, you know, am I asking too much? And it's like, no, I'm not. And so I really, I really try to go back and forth because I always try to put myself in other people's shoes. But at sometimes it's just not the best for me and my son because trying to put myself in someone else's shoes when they're not seeing my point, it just still doesn't solve the problem, you know? No, it doesn't. And um, I'm going to tell you, wait, I have a question before, okay. before I tell you what I was going to say. Um, so is he in a, a, a regular uh, a program? Like he's not, he's in a general education class? Yes, he's in a um, he's in a general education class, um, and he has a special needs uh, case manager through mm-hmm. the school. Um, he has actually has two: one that specializes in math, and one that specializes in um, English reading writing. Um, okay. And so um, they they pull him out, but it's been really challenging um, mm-hmm. because of the virtual setting that they've been doing more group settings than individual one on ones as they could do in the building. And so at this point he's in fourth grade he's like like mom i hate school mom i don't want to go to school and so and it's devastating when my son used to love going to school my son was excited to go to school like he was picking out his clothes and telling me what shoes he was going to wear and you know to now go to i hate school i don't want to read i don't want to write i don't want to do this and it but it changes with teachers right and i and i always i can pick up on it because it's not necessarily teaching him or mothering him or being as, you know, soft as I am with him. It's he can pick up if you are genuine, genuinely interested in helping him. He can pick up if you care about him. 
And I'm not saying that they don't care about him, just in the way that where he's receptive to willing to open up and let you come into his space and to be receptive to listening and um, trying to communicate with you, you know? Um, and so I just struggle and I feel like I always am the one reaching out to them before school saying, hey, did you read his IP? Mm -hmm. If you haven't read his IP, like here are the things that you can do to help him. Yep. Um, try these things with him if, it, if you want him to do something. My child is not the child where you can tell him to go do something and think he's going to do it. You might have to tell him five or eight times to do it. But the key to doing that is getting him to make eye contact with you, one. And then number two is getting him to repeat what you asked him to do. Mm -hmm. And that works for me in the household, right? And so I ask the teachers to do that. If you want to know if he understands what you're teaching him, ask him to recall it back. Ask him to show you. Um, and another example of that, because um, he's in fourth grade and they're doing the learning. And they, of course, they have these expectations for them. But I told the teacher, he's like, well, let me show you how to do it. So he shares his screen. I said, well, hey, can you have him share his screen so he can show you that he knows how to do it? Because at this point, I don't want my son getting left behind because what she, what he's learning in the fourth grade is going to means he has to know that when he goes to the fifth grade and he has to know it when he goes to the sixth grade, because by middle school, they're not reteaching you all the things that the foundations of those concepts in middle school and high school, you should know them. And so it's so important, you know, during this, ed, you know, the edu elementary school age that they are getting those basic concepts of math, of writing, of using a noun and what a verb is, you know, and it's like, they just don't get it when you're trying to tell them how to better, you know, mm -hmm. teach their, teach your child. And I mean, I get it. It's frustrating because I can only imagine as a teacher, you know, having four or five kids in my class with IEPs and all of them learn differently. And then I have the, you know, the children that um, can, you know, follow what I'm teaching you with no problem. I can see how it's problematic, but it's like, I don't have an answer on how to solve it, but we just have to do better. We have to do better. I have a question. Is, yeah. is he, do they have ICT placements there in Maryland or, or is that something that doesn't really happen? I don't even know ICT, what that is. Which is ICT is an integrated co-teaching classroom. So basically you have a special education teacher and a general education teacher, right? And it's a mm -hmm. regular size classroom, like 30, whatever amount of kids, right? And okay. then there's a certain amount that it's a capped at, let's say 12 kids with IEPs, right? But both of the teachers are teaching the same material, but they're in charge of differenti differentiating the instruction to meet all the students. So when mm. when you have that kind of environment, the teachers can tailor more what is happening in the classroom. And because, you know, the I guess the special education teacher is just in charge of a small percentage, they can, you know, target the students more closely. But not every school has that. So I don't know yeah. if you've if you I mean, the fact that you've never heard of it, maybe they don't have that in that. School. Yeah. And I want to say um it also, too, my kids go to a public charter school in Maryland. And so the rules are a little different when it comes to special education. They can't legally get out of, you know, out of, t you know, accepting a child that has special needs um, or they can't get out of um, providing services. But they can get out if you have a child with special needs and your the services require more than they can provide, then they can deny you um, going to the school. But. I wanted him in that school because it's a STEM school. And so they really focus, and it, it goes from kindergarten to um, high school. And the programs, if you know, if you stick with it from, you know, uh, my thought is from kindergarten to 12th grade, A, he will get, you know, that that STEM education, but also um, he what he's good at with math, he will be able to apply that with the math and with the science. So I really wanted him to stay there. And I was like, we want to deal with it. And he didn't really, he doesn't really require a whole lot of services, but he does need services. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say that in the middle school and in the high school, they do that. They do have that program where they have a special educator in the classroom and they have the teacher in the classroom. So in the middle school and in the high school, yes, they do have that. But in the elementary school, no, it is two people that are in the school and they are in charge of seeing every child that's in that school and managing their needs. Okay. I, this is like my, ugh, I don't know. Um, 
I'm not anti charter school. I'm not. Because, yeah. like, their model, you know, they're very rigorous and they yep. teach the kids, and a lot of the kids do really well. But the fact that the special education component in those schools, yep. and if you are out there and you work for a charter school and you disagree, please send your comadre gram. But from my understanding and what I've seen and heard from other parents is that, you know, if a child is not behaving or doing the right thing or not learning or like yep. following whatever it is that they're imposing on them, they kick those kids out. And yep. as a special education teacher and teacher uh, in public schools, we get these kids in the middle of the year, which is doing a disservice to the child. Yep. You know, December, January, February, we're getting kids that were in a charter school, but couldn't um, oh acclimate to the in environment or couldn't do whatever it is that they were asking them to do. Yep. And then it's so easy for them to just kick them out and send them to a pu regular public school. Yep. You know, and then and then the, the teacher in the classroom, and I'm sorry, I'm a little triggered by this, but the yeah, teacher no in the classroom now has to play like catch up and teach them all the routines that they missed in September right. and try to get them ready for that test. Because most of the time it's the third, fourth and fifth graders that get kicked out before them. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't knock charter schools. Their model can be better. And there's a yep. lot of area for improvement. Yeah. And I really want to work on that. And it's just like, I can't do it by myself, you know? Well, um, there has to be more parents. You need to yeah. be able to form a community. And hopefully through this podcast and, um, you know, our pla my platform, we can yes. try to start rallying more people around you to help you yes. out in the DMV area. Yes, I would really love that. Um, and that was something that I had really pushed for when he first got there um, at kindergarten. And they told me, you know, we have, you know, by law, we have to do X, Y, and Z. You know, we'll have to provide these services. But if it exceeds, then, you know, if we can't meet him or accommodate, then, you know, he can't stay here. Um, so we we got made it to fourth grade. <laughs> um, but I really had pushed when I, we first started in kindergarten. I was like, you know, please have all your teachers, even the specials like PE, STEM, um, they have Lego, they had, um, you know, the music, the Spanish. I want all of those teachers, cause they deal with everyone from kindergarten to fifth grade. You know, they don't see them every day. Um, well, they see them once a week, right? But it's like everybody in that building, I don't care if they're an adult and they have interactions with these children, they need to have some type of training. They need to know how to communicate with children with special needs. Not just children with autism, but all children, right? All children with special needs and this all so children simple. period because everybody's dealing with different things. It's so simple though. Even if yeah. they don't specialize in special education, there's workshops that you can go to. I know. I, I, I was a special education teacher. Yes, we learn a lot of theory, you know what I'm saying? But like, yep. there was a bunch of trainings that I attended that I put myself through because I wanted to be able to better work with my students. I went on mm -hmm. trainings for dyslexia. I went awesome. on a series for kids with autism. I went on all these different trainings just to know how to work with my students. And it's also, you know, are these teachers allowed to go to these trainings? Because that's another thing. I don't know how charter schools are structured or how they work. I know it's a lot of a business model, which yeah. is... It's good in the sense that if pe teachers are not performing, they're like they are not going to be there for very long. You know, yep. I I get that, but also there there needs to be the other piece where you're keeping the kids at the forefront because they're getting a lot of money to have these kids in the schools, and the fact that they're not providing training to these teachers to better work with these students is a little um disappointing for me. Yeah, and so that's the thing, right? Is because they have these days on the calendar, on the county calendar that's supposed to be for professional development, but I would I would love to see All how time. many teachers throughout the county or through for my son's school, how many of them actually, you know, did attend a a, a um, you know, a workshop on autism or on mm -hmm. dyslexia, like you said, or any special needs or like really what, what, what are they, what do you see more of the workshops being on? Is it more about more professional development or is it more, really, is it more on how I can better work with my, work with my students and understand and, you know, change the way I'm teaching to reach the, my children that I'm teaching, you know, I would love to see that, but no, I, I, I you know, the county I live in, I don't know. It's sometimes I question why I'm why I'm still here. Um, but again, I have a junior in high school. He's getting ready to be a senior, and so to leave and have him start, I just I will, don't want to devastate him, you know. So it's always that back and forth as a mom trying to make, figure out if I'm really making the best decision for my kids. Yeah, that's important. Um, 
So let's let's yeah. switch gears a little bit. Okay. Um, I want to know a little bit more about Dean. Can you tell me about him? Like, who is he? What makes him sparkle? Like, what kind of things? <laughs> Dean. Is he into? Like, I know he's really good with math, yeah. but like, what other things is he into? Dean is into his PlayStation. Okay, he wants to be a YouTuber. He wants to be in the NBA. He look. You get. I don't know if you heard him. But he's screaming. No, I do not. He's so nosy. He's a he is an ear hustler. Okay, <laughs> he is always in my business. He tells me I can't date. I can't go anywhere. He thinks he's my dad. He thinks he's a grown man. Okay, um, and um, he is just such a special kid. He brings us so much joy. He is a character. He's funny. He always makes us laugh. He is a jokester. He's a prankster. Um, he loves his music. Um, he is also very sweet. He's also very kind. He, you know, he's willing to help you and tell you something that give you some type of information that you never know that you needed to know. Um, he is, he's into his, he's really into his fashion now. He is into, yes. Oh yes. He wants, no, Dean, please. Oh yes, please go. Thank you. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, but he like he um, he likes to cook. Um, he's experimenting now with um, his drawings. You know, um, he's not a huge fan of drawing, but he is you know trying to figure out. He's really learning himself. He's trying to uh, figure out where he fits in. I think by him having an older brother to model after has been really mm -hmm. beneficial for him because um, it's helped with his social um, skills. It's really helped develop those social skills that um, he missed. Um, he loves his big brother. He looks up to his big brother. He loves his father. He, um, he, he's always, I mean, the, I'm going to tell you about my, okay, this is the kid is, he doesn't know boundaries, okay? And that's what has been the struggle. I remember um, my grandmother had took him on, and I'm telling this story because this this tells you who he is, right? He went on a field trip. One of the kids on the field trip was thirsty. They were in a park. My son goes to a stranger's cooler, opens their cooler, takes out some water, and brings it to the kid. <laughs> that is who my son is. You know, like... He is he is going to help you if you, he he if he thinks he knows how to solve the answer he's not going to tell you he has the answer he's going to go get it and like whatever it is um and when I'm sick he's a problem if I, solver yes <laughs> and if I'm sick he he's he's the first one to to you know ask if I'm okay what can he do um he always he always wants to cater to his mom you know um he always um. What, what I will say about him, though, is that he likes to, I don't know if this is similar to other moms um, that um, also have a child with on the spectrum, but he has to be near someone. He doesn't have to touch you, but he needs to be near you. So if he's not in his brother's room, he's in my room. If he's not in the living room, like we have to be some, not too many feet away from him for him to, you know, really thrive. And um, we finally got to a point where I can leave him, you know, home for uh, a few minutes so I can go run an errand. Um, so it, it really took baby steps, but he, he's showing that he's responsible, that I can trust him. Um, he, you know, he's just, he's, he's everything that I didn't know I needed, but also if he was my first child, he would be my only child. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So you were talking about a little bit about, um, some of your fears, you know, as, mm -hmm. or reservations as a parent of a child who's one day going to be a man with autism. And, um, yeah, you know, uh, I resonated a lot with that because that is real. You know, as people of color, um, yeah. we already have like some strikes against us in a way, um, as, yeah. as I mean, with respect to the police and things like that. And, um, you know, it, is there anything else like that worries you? Like, do you do you worry about his future? About like, what is oh. it gonna be like when, you know, when he's like ready to have a family or you know start dating and stuff? That's that's more sooner for you than than anything else. Yeah, and if you see my whole mood, just like <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, and, and, but it's good, and I I think if 
anyone can see if someone's watching this, then like, I think that'll help, you know, they, they, they'll get it right. I think you thinking about the future for your child is scary and it's even scarier for me. Um, in August, I had, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Um, it's been removed. Um, so it was really that moment that I was like, I was in the hospital for three weeks. How is my son? He was away from me. That's the longest he's ever been away from me. I literally didn't know what to do. So I started making videos to record to him to say, you know, I love you. I miss you. You know, make sure you're listening to your grandmother um, because he was so concerned. And because he was under 12, he can't visit. So I, I really couldn't see him during that time. But then when I came home, it was time to get ready for school. And it was like, Oh my God, like if something does happen to me, who is going to be able to step up and do the things that I've done for him? Who's going to know what to look out for? And, you know, when he starts to date and he wants to know about sex, I mean, he's already asking me about sex. Okay. And I'm just like, what? Um, <laughs> but, um, he's saying he's asking about dating. And I mean, the questions he has about sex is like, why do people do it? You know, okay. Yes. You do it to have babies, but why do you do it after babies? Well, if you already have a baby, why are you still, why are they still doing it? And I'm like, Oh, oh boy. we're going to table that conversation. Okay. Um, so I, I, I've, I'm concerned about that. I have concerns about, you know, how is he going to be able to, um, with his emotions, right? Because he definitely um, struggles with communicating how he's feeling. Um, I think he just knows mad and sad, right? But it's like, there's other emotions. There's anxiety. There's, there's fear. And um, it's just like him recognizing and distinguishing between the emotions that he's feeling and, you know, Dean, I really say, you know, when he's having his moments, um, sitting him down, you know, I sit any style with him on the floor at eye level and just like, I need you to tell me what's wrong. Like, you have to be able to tell me what's wrong. I can't help you if you don't tell me what's wrong. And so he has those moments where he's like 15 minutes just crying or, you know, just having a spell where he just doesn't know how to get how he's feeling out. And so I worry about that. I worry about the days that those that happens and he's at school and they can't get a hold of me or, um, you know, how is he going to be treated then? I worry about when he starts to drive, if he gets pulled over by a police officer, what, you know, what, 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 what do I do? You know, do I give him a bracelet that says that mm -hmm. he, you know, he's autistic? Does, was that going to, is that going to make a difference? Is that going to save his life? You know, mm -hmm. like those are things that I'm like trying to tr problem solve and think through. I'm trying to figure out his diet. You know, I'm allowing him to eat McDonald's and Chick-fil-A every other day because that's mm -hmm. all he will eat. And I mean, that's all he will eat. If I don't allow him to eat his rice, or have his fries, my son will starve himself. And to him, he's not starving himself. He's just, he doesn't eat what I buy. And I mean, I have mm. a refrigerator full of food. I have a deep freezer full of food, but he will only eat what he will eat. And so I, I'm concerned about his health in the future. You know, what what does that mm. look like for him? Um, I'm concerned about his education and going off to college. You know, is he going to be able to go off to college by himself? You know, will he, is he going to be independent? Will he, will he be able to live off, live on his own? And then again, with my scare, with my health, I'm thinking, how do I prepare for this? Right. How do I, how, what do I leave behind in case someone has to pick up the pieces for me? What do they need to know about my son what do they need to know about other programs and resources that they might need to apply for because in maryland there's an autism waiver um program of course it's closed but i mean when it, the list opens you got to jump on it to get your child on it and it's like you just want him on it on the list in the event that he's 18 and he might need the resources that he does have them right mm -hmm. um it's just there's so much that goes with it. There's so much fear. And um, I definitely try not to spend my days, cons you know, dwelling on the future. It's really just day by day. Um, but there are those moments where 
I'm like, what do I do? But the other day I had, I, since we've been going through this, you know, for since 2014, um, there's this um, program or resource in Maryland um, called Pathfinders for Autism. And they recently emailed um, a, like a toolkit for teens, like at 14, these are the things that you are skills that you want to make sure your child has or plans. And it goes from 14, I think Ooh. to 19. And so I'm like, took screenshots of it. I want to print it out because I want to start thinking about, okay, when he's 14, like these are the things I want to make sure I've taught him. These are the things that I want to make sure that he knows. And so it's really um, kind of planned in like that, that I I've been doing to try to help um, with my fears. But I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you talk, if you name it, it's a fear. I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned mm -hmm. about the future for my son and you know how are people going to accept him how are people going to treat him will people take advantage of him because you know he believes everyone is good yeah yeah um that's something that like i feel like a lot of the moms that i've interviewed it, it's it's a mm -hmm. common concern and at least through like through the podcast i have people that are um in the police force here in new okay. york city that um i'm you know, scheduling an interview with them and like kind awesome. of working out like what, like wh what can we teach our kids to do to keep themselves safe? Cause at the end of the day, they are, they're going to be men of color and mm -hmm. like their children right now, you know, they're going to grow up and be men. And um, we want to be able to set them up for success, not for right. failure, you know? Right. And, and I, I understand not um, influencing them to live in fear but also to give them that awareness that not everybody's going to understand who they are and value right. that, but, you know, so that they can be ready, you know, in the future. Yeah. So with yeah. that, comadres, I want to say good night or goodbye, rather. Um, and I'm going to end the podcast how I always do. Follow me at Comadre on the pod on IG, and you can follow Renee at... Oh, you can follow me at the mommies. Uh, oh no, I think it's. I'm sorry, forgive me, guys. <laughs> I don't even know my um at okay. my Instagram. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm sorry. It's the underscore mommies m o m m i e s manual m a n u a l one word. It's the underscore mommies manual. Perfect. Um, and if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to send me a comadregram via email at comadreando at esctheNetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. Um, and thank you for spending time with your comadres. Thank you so Bye. much for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. Bye. Thank you. Bye.